Well, hello, my name is Ray Hill. And the name of the program is Public Access Public Affairs. We do public affairs programming here because we used to be called Access Cable, so we kept part of that name, but we're actually Houston Media Source. People all over the world are listening to us on www.humstv.org because everything we do here and broadcast on Channel 17 Comcast and the other channels. And if you want to go to our website, that'll tell you where you are. Channel 99 on some of them, and it's a choice on others. But the fact of the matter is we're providing you programming that you can't get anywhere else because we watch and we know what's out there, and we try to fill in the gap. Again, my name is Ray Hill. I'm an occasional host, not always the host of this show, and I'm interconnected with the whole operation around here. I do radio here every Wednesday afternoon at uh, 2 o'clock, and so you can uh, get me in that way. Tonight, I've asked a friend of mine, Pat Hartwell, to come in. Pat, in my mind, is a very special person. Pat has what amounts to a full job time job. She visits people, not just in prison, but in the hardest part of prison, death row. And she does that regularly. It's a couple of days a week, she's up there visiting people in the visiting room on the Polanski unit. And then when there is an execution, she works overtime by going to Huntsville and calling the Execution Watch program to give us information so that we can do that work. Pat, welcome to PAPA, Public Access, Public Affairs. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How did you get involved in the death penalty issue in the first place? Well, I've always been political uh, since I was young because I grew up in an era where uh, you would be uh, foolish and living in a closet if you didn't become political back in the late 60s and early 70s. A wonderful era. It was. It well, yeah. We changed the world. Yeah, I learned a lot. We did. And, uh, and then I came to Houston, and I got hooked up with some very dedicated activists. Very it's all right to use names on them. Well, Gloria taught me a whole lot. Workers World Party. Gloria Ruback of yes. WWW. Taught me a whole lot. And uh, uh, I left for a while because uh, uh, I was uh, by then a single mother. Uh, after I split up for my husband, and uh, that was a full-time job to me. I still remained uh, an activist, though, because uh, I had been one of the first pole climbers for the phone company in 1970 right. or 71. A serious feminist advancement. <laughs> that was when you should do it back then. Absolutely. And then uh, when I came to Houston to uh, join Gloria, uh, it was decided that uh, she and I should break into the uh, trade unions, and Gloria became a carpenter, Yep. and I became a plumber. All right. So I was the first union woman plumber in Houston. And then uh, that was going along all right, and I went ahead and had my three children, and then uh, Ronald Reagan came to office. Yep. And uh, he got rid of the minorities uh, in government jobs as well as he could, and he did a pretty good job. And I was working out at NASA then because NASA had the government uh, contract for all the trade unions. And I stayed, uh, I went back to my children, and my husband and I were splitting up by then, and I taught, uh, they went to uh, a very progressive, uh, liberal, Montessori, open concept, no desk, Good. type school in Third Ward, and I taught geography there. And uh, I did other things. And then as they grew up, uh, I came back, and uh, I decided the death penalty was what I was going to do. Of course, I do other things. But you have poured yourself whole yeah. hog into the death penalty. Yeah, the death penalty. I had a very wise woman one time tell me, uh, Maria Jimenez. Oh, yes. I uh, and I worked Maria on, was a fine activist. She still is and yeah. worked on uh, uh, several uh, projects with her. And she told me very seriously one day, pick your project, Pat, and be a, be a champion at that particular one. Support the other ones. Go to the demos yeah. and support them, but concentrate on one. And I chose the death penalty. You know, in, in Houston, uh, there's a lot of good organizations doing great work. But the picket line, if we didn't rely on one another, 
are pretty slim. My friends in New York say, oh, you mean you work with RCP people and WWW people and, and, and uh, the, the Socialist Alliance people? I say, I work with anybody because i got to flush out the picket line and our numbers are thin. Exactly, and, uh, and we've learned to be uh, comrades in arms on those picket lines. Though we may disagree on the minutia of ideology, but our feet fit the same line. Well, we understand, those of us who are political understand who the real enemy is, sure. and it's not each other. Sure. We can work that out later. But on the picket line, um, I went to the Trump, anti-Trump oh, uh, yeah, yeah. rally, and I, I took my oldest grandson, Christopher, who just turned 13, and I was very encouraged by the diverse group that was there. That was the first time in a long time I had seen that many people there. As a matter of fact, I got a call this morning from the hotel union workers mm -hmm. that went back to the sidewalk and was down to the sidewalk, and the cops said, no, no, the sidewalk ends at this driveway and picks up out of the right. I said, no, 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 sidewalks don't end. Uh, sidewalks is all of our property and it's public access. I said, but don't argue with the officer. If you argue with the officer, you have got to be willing to go to jail. Exactly. And of course, I've got a line. If you're not willing to go to jail, they already have you under control anyway, so why worry about it? Uh, but the argument is tell the officer, oh, you think so? Why don't you arrest me and we'll ask the judge about that? Exactly. There's a way to talk to them. Absolutely. And they know who they can talk to. And they know that you know what you're talking about when you say, all right, take my ass to jail. We'll let the judge decide whether this is a sidewalk or an private property driveway. It's the same as at the walls. Yep. Uh, every once in a while they try to give us trouble and they try to argue with us and push and uh, we don't let them push. Yeah. We, they, they know how much they can, they can uh, do to us. And so. What is that like at the walls? You know, when somebody's being executed, I'm on the radio now. Yeah. I haven't been up there for uh, a demonstration in years because if there's an execution going, I've got work to do. I wish there was a way to do a live broadcast from there. Uh, the walls is a world of its own. Uh, depending on who's getting executed, it depends on whether the state wants to make a circus out of it or not. Um, sometimes just the family shows up. Sometimes only the activists show up. Sometimes 50 or 60 activists show up along with 50 cops uh, who will not shut up. Uh, the cops have lately maybe the last 10 executions have taken it upon themselves uh, to create problems uh, for the family of the guy getting killed. Uh, they have no regard uh, for anything. Tell me <clears throat> how that actually happens. There are people that are going to witness the execution and you're going to do this in the next execution. Uh, yes, now the people that witness the execution, they actually don't have anything to do with the people that are outside. At five o'clock, they drive them from the hospitality house down to that building right in front of the walls. That used to be, as I understand, the main administration building. It was, there was a yeah. time when it was the main administration, but look at it, it's too small. Yes, and you walk in there and you're uh, completely shut off from everything. Uh, when I witnessed Elvis's and there had been an appeal filed, we sat in there an hour and a half without knowing what was going on. And then they come and get you. Uh, of course, they're guarding you at all times, but they tell you to walk, and uh, you walk out the door that faces the stairs at the walls. You walk across there, and you Street. walk in. Yes. Um, now, outside uh, there... Uh, a couple of us gather at 4.30, uh, even though the execution is not until 6. The reason we gather at 4.30 is we stand for over 30 minutes on the street corner to inform the residents of Huntsville what is going on. Uh, as they pass by. As they pass by going home from work. And uh, they're getting used to us uh, by now. Unfortunately, there seems to be an execution every week or every third week, and so they know that we're there. What used to be very hostile has turned into 
a few hostile comments, but mostly a nod. And sometimes they stop and take pictures of us, and I'm always willing to talk to someone that wants to talk to me. And you periodically get students and staff from Sam Houston? Yes, but that's not at the corner. Uh, at 5 o'clock, another reason we stand at the corner uh, from 4.30 till about 10 after 5 is the family or the witnesses come from the oh. hospitality house down that one road and they turn left. We want them to know that someone is there for them, even if we don't know the family. A lot of times we do know them, maybe half and half we do know them. And then after they go in that small building, we walk down and we join uh, Gloria, who is on the microphone usually, and the group that I call uh, the more religious group. We have three or four of them that are holding candles. Some have rosaries. And that is where you see the Sam Houston students mm -hmm. come. And a couple of professors are regular. There's always the professor. Yeah. He never misses an execution. He's a good man. Well, and, and when you say hospitality house, hospitality is created by First Baptist Church. Yes. In, in Huntsville. And it is a budget residence for people who travel distance to visit Texas prisoners. Exactly. And uh, uh, they got a kitchen. A large one. And uh, sometimes they got some groceries because people leave groceries there. Yes. And it builds up. Uh, uh, and then there's a couple of people. Now, don't try to smoke. And these are Baptists. Don't try to drink. And don't bring anyone you're not married to. Oh, 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 oh yeah. You got to have a marriage license <laughs> to, to qualify. Yeah. But they do serve a purpose. Uh, oh, absolutely. A lot of people think they're only open for executions, and they're no, not. You can no, make an appointment and stay if you're coming from Yeah, I, we, have, we have European people visiting, not even associated with death row. Exactly. That come and stay at the hospitality house because it's cheaper than the Sam Houston Hotel. Well, yes, and it works on donations. Yeah. Uh, now, during an execution, the, the, uh, the three days before the execution, they do close it for just the family of the person being executed. And that is where, uh, when you come out of the uh, Polunsky at noon, that third day, uh, you have to go to the hospitality house. And uh, there you stay. And the reason you stay there is because you leave the unit about 10 till 12 after you're searched coming out of the unit and there, make sure you get on the road. And then you get to the hospitality house maybe 1.30, yeah. And uh, they feed you. Uh, they always have a home-cooked meal. And uh, the phone call from the prisoner that's going to be executed will start around 2 or 2.30. At the hospitality? At the hospitality house. There's one phone there uh, next to the two couches that come together, and you're allowed to talk until nearly 5 o'clock. And that's why they want you there. Okay. And then, of course, the witnesses uh, get an orientation, and they leave from the hospitality house. The family members and the friends that have decided not to uh, witness and decided not to join us on the picket line stay at the hospitality house. But they have the option of doing both of the other. Yes, they do. And uh, as I get to know the people at the hospitality house more and more, um, I'm welcome in there now. Yeah. And I will quietly, if I know the family, if I think it's appropriate, only if I think it's appropriate, I will invite them down to the picket line. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I keep my mouth but, shut. But all this is done with the kind of, uh, 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 kind of sensitivity. Yes, it is. Very much so. To the gravity of the event. Well, exactly. Um, most of the times, uh, because I do know a lot of the guys uh, on death row, I do not know all of them intimately. I don't write them personal letters, but they know of me. And I know a lot of them on death watch, of course. Um, uh, the, what, 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 is, what is death watch? Death watch is on a pod, um, and that is where... As soon as the judge signs your execution order, you're picked up in your cell. You're not told where you're going, uh, but you, you're 
taken to death watch. And that's where you stay until the day you die. And it's separate from the other parts of death row. But you're pretty isolated if you're on regular death row now. Well, you're extremely isolated. Uh, but on death watch, uh, there are 14 cells uh, and seven above and seven below. Uh, and then there's another wing that's pretty close that is still a pod. It's the secure wing. Okay. If you're behind what we call double doors for some reason, yeah. it's not uh, that you're in trouble. It's not F pod, uh, but they keep maybe the. See, see, you're using words and phrases, and, and I'm going to go back and pick up something that you said a live broadcast of Execution Watch from Huntsville. Technologically, we can do that uh, because we would use the internet as the connection mm -hmm. from uh, uh, outside the walls and doing it but I would have trouble hurting my lawyers. You know, I, 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 prison thinks they've got problem hurting convicts. I've got lawyers. That's got to be worse than convicts. Well, I have a suggestion for you. If you can't herd the attorneys up there, I have some people that'll take their place. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'd love to, have, you know, I, I would love to have some rotation among my attorneys. But I can't get anybody to spend as many hours that they spend on these cases for absolutely free because I deal with volunteers. I know how that is. Yeah, yeah, we all I do. I get paid zero for what I That's do. Absolutely, and, and me too. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's easy for me because I ain't worth nothing anyway, but if we've got a lawyer that would normally make $640 an hour for their work and you say, come on down and help us on execution work, they seem to think that the time they spend on that is worth something. Maybe not $640, but something. Well, if you can get one, we can fill in the rest. Oh, okay. That's a promise. Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll give that some, take that under advisement, as the judges are wont to say. Um, but but, but you, you talk about F-Pod and, and A-Pod, and F-Pod is a punishment section? Of yes, F-Pod is the disciplinary section where you're put on level two or level three. There's three levels on death row, one, two, or three. Uh, one is restrictive, two is more, and three is ridiculous. Three is like harsh treatment. It's extremely Is harsh. it as bad as food loaf and other things like that? Uh, they can be put on a food loaf while they're on level one. Really? Um, in fact, um, food loaf for our listeners is where they take the scraps that the other inmates have left behind in the kitchen mm -hmm. and they bake all of that vegetables and what little meat was there and bread into one baked loaf. Exactly. And then they carve that and uh, that's what food loaf is. And that meets the requirements, the caloric requirements of the state. Uh, when we went before the board, uh, the board allows us to speak publicly on anything that we want to talk about twice a year. And I had prepared a six-page nice presentation about the lack of food during lockdown on death row. And it got preempted uh, by the social media uh, problem that occurred that Thursday. And I took a friend up there, and she did a very good job in presenting what she could. And I got a letter yesterday, a one-page funky letter, that told me that the guys on death row were being fed adequately during lockdown. I know it to be a lie. And so after Charles solves his problem one way or another on June the 2nd, I'm going to tackle that. So that is an ancillary issue. It's not as grave as the execution itself. No. But it is an ancillary issue that deals with how people on the row are treated. Our guys are starving. And I don't say that lightly. Um, they're starving. Not all the men have families to send them money for commissary. That's true. Uh, the ones that have this family or support to send them commissary are, are well off. I would say there's at least a third of the guys back there that you never hear from. If I told you their names, you wouldn't even know their names. And so 
these are guys that I worry about. I don't worry about Big Flo or Big Lou who has family coming out of their ears. Yeah. I worry about the the young, the young men that have nobody. nobody at all. And uh, I know our guys are starving because when we go up there to visit, I'm not the only one that visits. We are allowed to take in $25, which is, uh, to me, that's an enormous amount when I go three times a week yeah. uh, from my Social Security check. You take in $25 for visits? Per person. Per person. Per person. Okay, and you take bills and change? No, you have to stop by the bank. It's all quarters. It's uh, dollars. Oh, no. I always get dollars because I get frustrated putting quarters okay. in. There is a machine at the where they search you, but you never can count if that machine really works or not. Okay. So there's a bank at the corner, and um, when the guys, when we, we know they're on lockdown. See, you're talking about a culture that my audience doesn't have a hint. No, and it's a completely, people don't, people say, oh, we send them to prison and they get three meals a day in a cot, and three it's squares in a cot. And that's not ain't? true. None of that's true. Uh, TDC cut out three meals a day on weekends, what, four or five, oh, years, four or five ago. years ago? Four or five years ago, yeah. Um, let me tell you what they got on lockdown and see if you could live on it. Uh, they got one hard biscuit and a teaspoon of, between a teaspoon and a tablespoon of peanut butter on that biscuit. Some of the guys got one biscuit, some guys got two biscuits. There was no drink. For lunch, they got two peanut butter sandwiches on stale bread. Uh, once again, with the tablespoon of peanut butter. No drink. Dabbed in the middle of the bread. Yes. I've seen those. Uh, which had been in the ice box, so it was hard. It was clumped together. For supper at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they got two peanut butter sandwiches. Oh, excuse me. Let me back up. For lunch, two peanut butter sandwiches and one prune. One prune. One prune, 25 Well, with calories. the peanut butter, the prune come in handy. Yes, well, that's why they give them the prune. Yeah. And then for supper, they got two peanut butter sandwiches and a prune or one meatloaf sandwich, one peanut butter sandwich, and a prune, no drink. When I added up the calories, uh, because it made me so angry after these guys would come out and they would obviously be hungry, obviously, um, I started adding it up they're getting between 1,100 and 1,450 calories a day. All day. All day. The state, uh, even the state minimum standards, and we're in Texas, so you know they're minimum, uh, they say you should get 24 to 2,800 calories. And they're not getting half that. They're not getting. And that was what my speech was about. Um, I was called into the warden's office uh, after I gave that speech. And I was told that there obviously had to be a discrepancy uh, with what I wrote. And I said, oh, okay, well, show me the discrepancy. And he started telling me what they had been fed. And I said, I listened to him a minute and I said, they didn't get any milk. Who gave them milk? You know they didn't get any milk. I know they didn't get any milk. He checked into it. They had not been given milk. Maybe the guys in general population had that day, but not our death row guys. They weren't even given that cheap Kool-Aid off-brand stuff. Yeah. So he promised me on the next lockdown they would do it, and I promised him I would be looking. Sure, sure. It's That's all I can do. It's your job, yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the food. Uh, people that are listening to us... Uh, Oftentimes, and I know a lot of people overseas do their best, and we count on the people for, from overseas because that $20 a month and that $30 a month they send to those guys uh, mean a whole lot. Uh, so please keep in mind that these guys are hungry. Uh, this is not counting that they have to buy their own deodorant. Well, home, you're talking so. to people that are already involved. How does someone get involved? You can go, uh, there's, there's uh, web sites out there. Uh, since TDC has legally shut us down right now, we're having to be very careful. 
Um, there's pen pal sites that have been able to keep up. Uh, there's Life Spark. There's Life Lines. Uh, you can go on my page, Pat Hartwell. Pat uh, Hartwell Facebook page? Pat Hartwell Facebook page. Okay. Um, my Facebook page is open. You can get a wealth of information there. Uh, send me a message. I'll send and you a And on, on a Facebook page, you're exchanging information and you're repeating information you get from other sources. It's the standard operation of that. Yes, I never repeat information I get from a prisoner. That would be illegal. Really? I do it all the time on mine. I'm glad. I wish they would come. See, the trouble of it is, Pat, <coughs> now I don't mean this boastfully, but I am Ray Hill. Mm -hmm. I have sued the city of Houston more than anyone else in history over police behavior. And I've sued in federal court on other issues as well. They'll never come after me. My lawyers are better than their lawyers. Well, I'll start putting the guy's stuff on your page. Absolutely. Feel free um, to. No, 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 I'm serious. Yeah. It's easy for you to put stuff on my page. It is not a closed page. It's an open page. Anybody in the... If I don't like what I see on my page because I don't ideologically agree with it, I just take it off. Huh. But That's you are welcome to put anything you want to on my page. Well, the reason that I stopped it is because of Charles Flores. Uh, he's one of my very close friends, and I have been legally working with him for the past eight I know. You, you, in my mind, you reacted to that mm -hmm. more fearfully than I found characteristic with Pat Hartwell. Well, because... You usually got some kind of gonads, girlfriend. You've, you've, got a, uh, you've got a guy that's facing an execution date, and if his commissary... His radio, his uh, typewriter, mm -hmm. and his fan is taken away from him uh, on death watch facing an execution date now, in a month. would they do that to everybody on death watch? Take all that stuff away from them? Well, they, they, have, that, they have that option, yes. Uh, the reason but I... they don't have to do that. No, oh, no, no, no. Uh, there was a guy a couple of years ago, Chili... Uh, who was facing an execution date, and he got put on restriction. We went before the board to beg them to give him his stuff back, and they wouldn't do it. He got to stay an hour or two before he was going to be killed, and he, he still didn't get it back after he got off the, the stay. So they have the power to yeah, they got all the power. these men of everything and... I was not willing to do that to Charles. Now, if Charles gets a stay before next Thursday when he's scheduled, we have already talked about it. We'll go much further and fiercer than we are now. Now, there is inherently a countdown toward an execution. And usually someone goes and files a last-minute appeal for a stay. And that seems it, it rarely works. I've seen it work two or three times. Yeah. Uh, I've seen us get all the way to the Supreme Court on execution night, and it worked. But that Big book. But yeah. works so rarely that it seems to be like it's kind of a game of chicken. Well, you know that, that Supreme Court justice that dropped dead? Yeah. Uh, he... Uh, and I have to paraphrase Scalia. him because I don't even know exactly what he said. But uh, he said, it's not whether you're innocent or guilty, it's how you play the game. No, it, it, the exact quote, because I took note of it, and, and one nice thing about being Ray Hill is I memorized like the Gospels. I got a great memory. He said that what is always before the court was the nature and the conduct of the trial. Guilt or innocence is not for us to determine, nor should we care. And that got distilled several different ways down, but it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Guilt or innocence is not an issue before the Supreme Court. They're only worried about the mechanisms whereby the death sentence was reached. Well, I know that uh, I've seen those briefs uh, that some of the attorneys file. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, for a lack of a better word, you know, I won't, I won't say too much about them. I saw the brief that was filed for Charles, and I was able to argue that it not be filed. And there were five rewrites, and um, if it works, it works. It's the best brief I've ever seen. Now? Now, right now. The brief that he has right now. It is not before the Supreme Court yet. It's still No, sitting. it doesn't get to the Supreme Court. It goes no. up, it goes up uh, the ladder. We're hoping. That's all we can do. By the way, uh, audience, you can call in if you want to. Telephone number is spread across the bottom of the thing. Uh, Pat and I are not afraid of you. Now, we will, both of us, answer your question rather bluntly if necessary. That's our deal? That's that. Okay. I, if I don't have anything else going for me, I do yeah, answer bluntly. Absolutely. because Well, what, we, what you're dealing with here, and, and of course I'm dealing with it too because... I am the host, thank God not the producer, but the host on Execution Watch. And uh, Execution Watch happens uh, uh, every time there is an execution. And part of that show is Pat calling in and me saying, Pat, what's going on? And she tells me the witnesses have crossed the road or in the alternative, the witnesses have not crossed the road. Mm -hmm. And then if the witnesses have not crossed the word, re road, we understand that there's some kind of delay and we have to decide whether or not we're going on with the program. We don't have to go on with the program. I have made a bad judgment about three times that we do not have in our archives uh, execution watch audio tape of an execution because I said, ah, it's not going to happen. And guess what? It happened. Yeah, there was one a couple of a couple of times couple ago of months, that yeah. uh, it was, uh, but fortunately at the hospitality house, I had had a reporter with me from the Netherlands, Linda Pullman. Yeah. And, uh, and she and another local woman and another local woman, uh, we were the only ones there. Um, but we stayed there. Yeah. Uh, and, and it worked out. We well, they didn't. They, they, did, they didn't even. They didn't even take witnesses across the road till after seven o'clock. No, we were off the air. and and it was dark. We had. No, I got up there. I couldn't even see what I was doing. Uh, the uh, guards, the the victim's family was walking around on the parking lot. Uh, I had to steer them to the other side of the of the uh, building. Yeah. Uh, you know, it it, it was. Uh, it wasn't fun up there that night at all. Uh, we've always got to keep in mind who we're looking out for. We always give sympathy to the victim's family. No one should have died in that instance, whatever instance it yeah, is. Yeah, I know. You made that very clear in an interview I did with you earlier today that's going to be played in the event Charles is actually executed. And that'll be the first time I've deviated from pattern. If an inmate is about to be executed, we invite them, if they want to, to be the interview on that show. It makes my life much more miserable because instead of sitting there and reading a name off of a piece of paper, mm -hmm. I'm talking about somebody that I have eyeballed yes. eye -eye and interviewed. And, and, and that's the wear and tear of doing it that way is significant. Now, I've had friends on death row that have been executed. Uh, Billy Hughes and I were close personal friends for decades. And uh, they killed him. And I don't know what I'm going to do when they, if they execute Robert Pruitt. He's in August, August the 23rd. Yeah. And this would, if he got to stay, would be his fifth stay. Fifth or sixth, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, I know. And uh, I am absolutely convinced that uh, <coughs> the evidence does not indicate guilt in any way. Well, the state, they tested uh, the DNA on the weapon, I believe, and they found out that not only was it not his DA, <laughs> DNA, it was uh, someone else's, and I don't understand why they cannot test the guards that were on duty that time and why they can't... Well, I, because the, the officer that was killed, and, and if, we get, if we get off in the ditch of independent cases, we've deviated from where we're going. But Robert Pruitt is there for killing an officer in mm -hmm. Texas prison. The officer he killed was scheduled within a couple of weeks to testify before the grand jury, the same grand jury that indicted... 
Robert Pruitt, indicted two other officers. Mm -hmm. And it just happened to be that those were the officers that investigated the death that Robert Pruitt is accused of. Yes. And that prison is notoriously known for drugs and contraband in that prison. I didn't know that officer. Uh, however, I think there was some hanky-panky going on. And so uh, it, it's, it's, it baffles the mind. Is life so cheap in Texas that a sufficient number of people just don't care when somebody is executed or killed that way? I don't think so. Um, growing up in Texas, as we have, sure. uh, and, and we were taught in the 50s and 60s, we're Texas proud. Uh, no one tells us what to do. No one tells us how to do it. Um, we do what we want. And if you don't like it, don't let the door hit you on the rear end on the way out. We laugh about that, uh, but it is apparent that that's the way our state government is run. Uh, I read in the paper today, Ken Paxton is going looking for, uh, uh, for school districts for the transgendered yeah. uh, children. Yeah, right, right. Seriously? But this is the same well, well, you know, attitude. Yeah, right, 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 right. The same attitude. Um, execution is vengeance. It serves no purpose. If it did serve a purpose, we would not have killed 500 and what, 30, uh, 30. You keep track of it. Yeah, 537 of them. Uh, someone would have realized, you know, maybe I ought not to go rob that store. If you do the same point. thing over and over again and get look, expecting a different result and you ain't getting it, then that's madness. That's an old AA thing. You know. Well, yeah, and, and, and it's, it's exactly correct. Texas lives on vengeance. We, we are set in our ways. Um, but we know, Pat, we know that over the last five years, there have been ups and downs in the graft, but fewer people favor execution now than did five or six years ago. That, now, that hasn't been a straight down bent. It has ups and it has downs, uh, ups and downs. But if you put the statistical average to it, it is going down at a pretty decent rate. Well, that's true when you sit in a room and look at stats. Uh, however, uh, one person two weeks ago got admitted to death row, and then one person this week is being admitted. And then there's one in the can coming from uh, Webb County, I believe. Uh, so... I don't look at it that way. <laughs> it's not. I, I do see the stats because I run stats a lot. Well, Harris County, for instance, which used to be the most executing county in in the, That's the true. country, not just in Texas, uh, uh, we have remarkably fewer executions. We have remarkably fewer people that are getting sent to death row, yeah. not, not executions. I was at the last trial. The no, no, because there's a backlog, enormous yes. backlog. Yes, there's uh, 16 people waiting for capital uh, trials right now in Harris County. I was at the, uh, attended the trial of Jonathan Sanchez, uh, uh, who the, uh, the attorney argued, of course, against the death penalty. It was the first case that I have ever seen that the DA was asking for the death penalty and they lost. I would have given a million dollars to have a cell phone in that courtroom when they announced it. Well, but you were in there for part of the trial. I was in there for all of how, it. How do you, and I know you're, this is, I'm asking you to make a, a subjective response. Why do you think they lost? Well, they lost because they were crooked. Um, they, they got they, caught? They, they were losing, and then they pulled out such stunts as, 
You do know if you send him to general population, he'll be able to work in the kitchen and get a knife, and the kitchen is right next to the dock, and so he'll be able to escape with a knife. And then when one of the jurors started laughing, uh, then they spent all the next day, uh, because he was a uh, person who did a lot of tattoos on himself, and he had done some illegal tattooing in Harris County while he was waiting. He had a, a, a young wife uh, with long black hair, and he had two little boys that he wanted to do a tattoo of them. Well, his wife was a young woman who might or might not have looked, looked like one of the victims. When I saw the victim that survived, they didn't look alike. Uh, the DAs tried to tell the jury that that tattoo on his arm was the victim that survived and he was laughing uh, at her. Uh, come to find out, uh, the wife had saved the pictures that he had sent her of the tattoo and uh, was able to pull them out on the stand. That's why they lost that case. What happened to the case? Did he get life without he got parole? Life, he got life without parole. He got life without parole. And that's what he wanted, even though I don't believe in a life without parole for it's a not, As far as I'm saying, just another execution. Yes. However, people, some people do better in prison than others, to wit. Ray Hill did real well in prison. Well, and I, I, I really don't think the man is going to be working in a kitchen with a butcher knife that can be, I think they're with chains even if yeah, they do yeah, work sure. with butcher knives. But this is the tactics that the DA uh, uses uh, to draw the hysteria Shock and awe. of the, uh, of the, the jury. Um. Well, uh, those kind of tactics were used in the trial in Corsicana, Texas that uh, sent uh, an innocent man to prison for killing his kids. Oh, Todd, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, exactly. And they're, and they're, I mean, they were Todd used. Todd Cameron. The, 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 the same tactics were used in Charles Flores' case. Um, he's an innocent man. I used to think when I first got around the death penalty, even though I didn't believe in the death penalty, uh, I could not understand how many of these guys uh, could be telling the truth when they said that crooked stuff went on in their trials. Yeah. And now that I investigate each one of them, these guys aren't lying. Uh, I well, well, I mean, I mean, I've been around trial courts long enough to know that trial is not a debate. One side debating, it's a, it's a more like a speech contest. Mm -hmm. The lawyer telling the better story. Exactly. Uh, uh, is the one that's going to win. And uh, the outcome of trial has a great deal to do with how the jury is selected. Yes, and we know in Dallas County uh, there was a big deal about how to select a jury. Oh, yes. No Hispanic, no gay person, no woman that wears makeup. The list went on and on. Uh, I do believe that Harris County had one just like it, but they were smart enough to not burn Not to it. write it down. Well, or, or burn it, uh, and Dallas County was not. In fact, that's what one of the things that we're using in Charles' uh, brief. Um, you just can't get away with this type of racism and blatant lying forever. Well, I mean, Pat, I, I, I just posted something the other day. All cops lie. They get excited about get convictions, and they don't have the whole picture. But as they're under oath, that is treated as evidence, and so they lie to get a conviction. Narcotics cops lie most of the time. Oh, yeah. Most of the time they're telling lies because what they're trying to do is it's undercover work, and nobody was there except the undercover officer and the person he busts. And... What happened to the money is one question. What happened to the dope is another question. Mm -hmm. And so narcotics cops lie. Most of the time they're under Vice cops lie in every case. Oh, of course. In every case. Because they're going in there to get their jollies, and their jollies including abusing the women that they usually arrest. Well, exactly. Um, it is well known, and, and I've written this on my Facebook countless times, you've got overzealous cops, You've got lousy investigators. You've got the DA that has overpromised the victim's family. And then 
they have to make up all of that and then they get in front of an unsuspecting juror who really is there to help. Yeah, there is. That, that's really, really concerned, what they right. want to do. And it becomes a game. Uh, it hurts our guys. And, and I want to intercede uh, this thought. Don't, any of our listening audience, please don't ever think that I'm all for opening up the prison doors and everything. No, the option is out. rarely execute or cut loose. Yes. Uh, I do believe that some should be in prison for, for a, long, a time. long time. I do believe that if we had a decent parole board that operated like it should operate, we wouldn't have the problems that we have and we wouldn't it wouldn't be a all or none sentence them to death that's what parole boards are there for most of these guys on death row have rehabilitated themselves the ones that are even the ones that are not innocent have rehabilitated themselves give them a chance after 25 years even 30 years Next to Pat is a list of the people who are scheduled for execution. I know it's a little small on your television sc screen, <laughs> but uh, next to Pat is that list. It's the names and the dates they are scheduled to be executed. Now, Pat prints a flyer, and I've got one of those with me. The information on that came from this flyer. You can't see this very well because it's even smaller. How would one get a, hand, a hold of your list? Go on my Facebook page. It's already there. It's already there. Uh, the reason that the print next to me is so small is because there's so many on the list. Yeah, th there's not always this many. No, but it runs around this. And you can go to executionwatch.org, which is my website. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it is a couple behind because we haven't kept it update like we should, but close enough, the next scheduled executions are there. Or you can go to the prison show. You can go to the prison show. and I put it on the show. prison show. And the reason I put it like this, um, I, uh, I want you to look at the faces. Of the people involved. Of the people. I want you to go on my Facebook page and after e on each picture, I, I put a paragraph of some sort. And you can go to TDC's Facebook page or, or uh, website, and they put the information that they feel. Now, I would, suggest, <laughs> I would suggest that you have a look at TDC's first and then go to Pat's and see the difference in the characterizations of what happened in those cases. Exactly. And then when the case actually comes down, listen to the prison show because we sort through it. Uh, people say, well, you're just, you're not good advocates. No, we're journalists. And we put the information up from the sources that we have access to, which is the trial transcript. Not everything that is presented to the trial makes it a transcript. The judge has absolute control over that. We go to the media contemporaneously with what happened. Not every reporter tells the truth or gets it right because reporters are getting her information from cops who are probably going to lie under oath anyway. But we look at all of that and we present that. And then frequently, not all the time, but frequently, I let my lawyers have an opinion. I don't normally do that in every show. But if it is so clear, like the Todd Willingham case, mm -hmm. that there was not a crime. My lawyers uniformly said this man didn't commit a crime, he's being executed for nothing, and on that four occasions of during the show, I have relaxed my rules and allowed them to have an opinion because I knew they were going to tell me this man needlessly died. Well, when Charles, if he comes up for execution, uh, I'll give you the brief and you can read off the brief. Well, I would like for the lawyers to have the brief because they're going to study. Uh, yes. They probably, if the brief has been filed, they've studied. They've already got it. I hope so. They study, they study the appellate briefs and they study the trial transcripts. I will, uh, I will be on the inside. Yeah. Uh, I will be witnessing. Uh, so I won't have anything to do with execution. Yeah, but the producer of this show said, well, why don't you interview Pat when she gets out of the execution? Pat, you're not going to be in a condition for an interview when you get out of that room. When you watch, uh, I've watched someone die 
on the gurney. It's a, it's a feeling that cannot be described. It's a surreal uh, feeling to watch a perfectly healthy person uh, strapped down and within 20 minutes he's dead. Even when we put down dogs or cats, uh, they're ill. We don't put down a healthy animal. But to watch this happen to a healthy person, it leaves you, it, it, first you feel like you've been hit in the chest with a bulldozer. And then you walk out and you don't know what to say. It's, a, it's an, empty, an empty feeling of you're just standing there trying to grasp what you just saw, knowing that what you just saw is unnatural. I was at one point going to be a journalist. That didn't work out. But I wrote one essay comparing Texas death row executions to the blood sacrifice in classic Mexican societies. Like the Mayas. Where the Aztecs, Aztecs and the uh -huh. Mayas who sacrificed people to appease the gods, to have the gods give them things. There's no difference between those two things. Well, I don't know. At, at least when you're appeasing the gods, you have a fulfillment. You hope. I mean, you, yeah, you hope. When you kill somebody, because I've watched, uh, I've watched and read about the victim's family coming out, and it seems as though that when they come out for that interview, because they're allowed to be interviewed mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, um, we're not allowed to be interviewed. <laughs> yeah. I wish Jason would allow me to be interviewed. Um, a few of them will say, oh, we're happy. But I would, like, I would challenge them to tell us again in a month how they feel. There's no closure in that operation. They, there may be the illusion of temporary closure, but it doesn't bring back to them what they have lost. Well, it's the illusion that is being fed to them by the overzealous DAs and people like Andy Kahn who tell them they will get closure they will feel better. And then that night... It seems that way. It seems that way, but the next day and the day after, I don't remember the man's name, the brother of the victim of Carla Faye Tucker. Yeah. Uh, he comes to... Well, he's in ill health now. But, but he, he comes to anti death He comes again. to our demonstrations to Linda help Linda White. Yes. Listen... Pat, I love you and I appreciate this, but we are run plumb out of time. I got to talk to these people here for just a minute. You're not going to get this kind of candid discussion of this kind of sensitive issue in any other part of the media. Uh, if you were on commercial television, they would have interrupted it 15 times with uh, minute-long commercials and broke up your chain of thought. If you listen to it on non-commercial media, well, one of the stations would have run some programming, programming underwriting announcements at the first and in the middle and at the end. Even on my beloved Pacifica, it's hard to get this much time to go in this depth with my friend Pat Hartwell. I just brought her down here so that I could shamelessly expose her through these cameras into your house to you and your family. Now, this is not going away. This program will be archived on HMS TV's archive, and you'll be able to see it again. It will be rebroadcast on this station several times. You're watching it live this night, but it will be rebroadcast over and over again because we think this is important enough information to get out there and expose to people at random. First, we get the insomniacs, those that are up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and turn on the television, and there we are. And then we'll get to people that have viewing habits that are different from that. Houston Media Source is a public service. We exist solely for the purpose 
that you can create the media that you think needs to be in the broadcast realm. You can come over here and use our cameras and our studios and make your own programming. You can bring your friends and you have friends in the neighborhood of people that need to expose their ideas to a broader audience. And if you ain't ready for television, we've got a radio station, a radio studio right around the corner. You can start there and go into television later. Gosh, I really appreciate your putting up with us tonight. And you found that Pat Hartwell is tough old coot is an entirely lovable creature because she's got a heart bigger than her chest can contain. My name is Ray Hill. You're watching Public Affairs, Public Access. Thank you on behalf of HMSTV.org and HMSNetRadio.org. I'll see you down the trail. Think about the media you need to do and thank you again, Pat, for joining us. Abolish the death penalty. <laughs>